afternoon, and thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. So um, we'll start with um, speaking um, a little about the situation uh, in Iraq in general, and then uh, I'll talk about the situation of Christians in the past almost two years now. So um, let's see. Okay, uh, you probably remember um, two years ago when the Islamic State, ISIS, had uh, started putting on uh, Christian properties like homes or stores or things like that, uh, letter N in Arabic, which means it belongs to Christians. And uh, they marked it with uh, a sentence, Iqarat al Islamiyah, a property of Islamic State. So that was the beginning of uh, persecution in 2014. This is the map of Iraq. The yellow um, spot in the north is where the ISIS start controlling the places. It's basically Nineveh Plain. Nineveh is the state. Mosul is one of the cities of uh, Nineveh. And around Mosul, there used to be, still are, Christian um, communities, Christian towns. I come from a Christian town called Karakosh, which was the largest Christian community in Iraq. It was about 50,000 people. Uh, we are all Syriac, right, in Karakosh, but the main um, denomination in Iraq for Christians are either Syriac or Chaldean. So. In Iraq, Christians uh, numbers or numbered about um, a million and a half in 2003, uh, three, just over 6% of the population of the country, which is about 33 million. After 2003 war, uh, if you remember, after what we call libera uh, invasion of Iraq, which is called liberation in the US, but invasion of Iraq in 2003 war, the estimate number of Christians dropped to as low as less than half a million. Today, it estimates about 200,000 people, and that is pretty optimistic, actually, because people keep leaving for different reasons. We'll talk about them in a second. Um, so, uh, as I said earlier, Christians were living mainly in Nineveh Plain, but we still have Christians living like in Baghdad or in Basra, different places. But they mainly try to live in small communities where they can practice freely their religions. And under Saddam and even after that, um, Christians were given the right uh, to practice their religions and uh, they were given also the Sunday off. So we all Christians got Friday off and Sunday off of work. So we had to make up for the work the rest of the week. Uh, also, they were allowed to live uh, uh, alone in these communities. Some of these communities did not have Muslims in them. Some of them did. But uh, we were also, in these Christian towns, allowed to teach Catholic education. Uh, so I, I went to public school all my life, but I had theology, religion classes, all the way through my, uh, under, uh, well, through high school, primary school and high school. In 2014, when the ISIS started moving um, toward Iraq, they took first place Mosul, the city, the main city. Then they started advancing toward uh, the small Christian towns. So we, in July, 4th of July, 2014, was when the Islamic State of ISIS basically uh, moved to Mosul or took over Mosul, and then by August, August 6, uh, they took other Christian towns like Karakush, Karmles, Bartilla, Bahshiqa, Tilkef, Tilusqaf, and Batnai. People from these towns had to leave overnight. They had to leave their homes. This uh, map I got from the internet, obviously. It shows how uh, the ISIS had uh, been moving through Syria and Iraq. So the red is all 
uh, where they have controlled so far. And uh, just to east of Mosul, the yellow part is where Kurdistan is. Kurdistan is part of Iraq. Um, it's the Kurdish government that controls the place. Uh, they speak Kurdish language. Arabic is comes second uh, in, uh, in that region. So most of us who had to flee Mosul had to go to Kurdistan. So why did we leave? When ISIS started controlling Mosul or entered Mosul, they uh, gave Christians three choices. It was either to uh, convert to Islam or pay the tax, which they call jizya, uh, or be killed. To tell you the truth, in the beginning, we didn't know any of this. The ISIS entered, the Christians left. They were so afraid of them. But one of our convents, our sisters had to leave also, and they walked most of the night to uh, closest Christian town. But they were able to go back to Mosul, even after the ISIS controlled the place. Uh, they did not stop them. They went a couple times and got some stuff, some papers that they needed from the convent, because there were some things that they needed to deal with, which they did, and no one stopped them. But later in July, they gave these three options. So every Christian had to decide what they want to do. So mostly, most of Christians had to leave. But this time, when Christians, they, uh, when they were leaving, they had to leave empty-handed. So they were not allowed to take anything. Even their cars, they were stopped uh, just outside of Mosul and let go on foot. So um, they could not take anything with them. So people left. Uh, everything behind, they didn't want to pay the tax because they said, this is our country, why do we have to pay for someone else to live here? And, of course, they didn't want to convert to another religion, and they didn't want to be killed. So they did fourth option, which they did not know if they were really going to survive it or not, but they did. So uh, ISIS entered Mosul, then Christians um, in the north part and east side of, uh, of Mosul started um, doubting what's going to happen. We didn't re really understand what was happening, um, so we couldn't take decisions. We didn't learn from what happened to Christians in Mosul. It was kind of, this has happened to them, it's not going to happen to us. So we stayed in our place. We didn't move. And we kind of were hoping that um, Kurdistan, the Bashmirga army, was going to fight for us. But August 6, um, 2014, we all had to leave. And um, when we were leaving the convent, we realized, my community uh, sisters, were 24 of us, we realized we were the last people leaving the, the town, really. But we didn't know that. We just got a phone call from a friend saying, well, you are almost the last people in town, so you better move out. So we left. We thought we were going to be gone for a day or two, maybe three days a week, but we never thought it was going to be for a very long, long time. And when we left, we all like, took very few things with us, thinking we are, again, going to return. Uh, we realized how serious the situation was the minute we left the town, um, the checkpoint. There was hardly anyone at the checkpoint, and we were supposed to be um, you know, uh, defended by the Bashmirga army, but there was none. We start leaving and there is no one. We just, we are seeing people leaving like us. Some are on foot, some are riding their bicycles because that's the only thing they had. Some were just in their cars, so it wasn't, no one was clear on what's happening, but we knew we just had to leave. And we left because the ISIS were really getting closer and closer to the towns. And for the past three nights before that happened, we could hear all the fighting that was happening between uh, Peshmerga and, uh, and uh, ISIS. So this is one of the pictures that we took at night, people leaving. And uh, when we left the house, we knew we were going to Kurdistan. It's usually, from my hometown, it's usually an hour and 15 minutes. That night, we start at midnight at 12, 
but we did not uh, we did not get to Ankawa Erbil until 9:30 in the morning. There were so many people driving the same direction, going to the same place. We did not even know where we were going. Like we really didn't. I was just driving, like have no idea, following people, and everyone was going the same direction. So there was like nowhere to go. So we got to Ankawa, uh, and that was the really the shock. There were so many people there, and there was no place for them. No place for them. So you could, people were on the streets, in the park, uh, at churches, uh, the gardens at churches, everywhere. They, they had nowhere to go. So before the displacement, Ankawa, the town we went to, and we went to this town because it's a Christian town. So it was about 30,000 people. But overnight, it became 200,000 people. So it was more than they could really deal with. And because no one was expecting all this mass exodus, no one was prepared for it. So there were no humanitarian organizations, uh, no community to help, no one to help. The government did not move. So there were no one to do anything. So it became, everything became the responsibility of the church to deal with. Um, so churches, this is a church that people were staying there, sleeping, um, because there was no other place for them, garden of the church. And uh, finally, we were able to uh, get permission from the government to open the schools and to use the school as a shelter for people. So um, we had, like, every classroom, we had two, three families in one classroom because there was no place to put them. Uh, we also had uh, to put tents in parks for people to, to stay in. So public institutions, uh, schools, and sports centers were open for the ITPs. Here I'll just stop for a second to explain. Um, the, we are called interiorly displaced people because we are in our own country displaced. We don't get the, the term um, refugees. And that's very important because refugees have some rights, but the IDBs basically have no rights. Um, because we are in Kurdistan, it's a different language, so people could not like go to schools because the schools are in Kurdish and we don't know the language. We speak Arabic. Christians speak Aramaic too, but it's not useful there. Um, we could not travel anywhere because we are interior displaced, so we had no right to obtain visa. And that was one of the reasons people start leaving Iraq, because if they just cross the borders, go to Jordan or Lebanon or Turkey, then they get a refugee status. And they can work uh, or apply through UN for, uh, for settlement in another country. So we are called IDPs. Um, and basically, the IDPs in the beginning, uh, like we were no one, basically no one. I mean, no one really cared. By the end of 2014, it turned out that there were about 2 million Iraqis in Turial displaced, IDPs, just Iraqis, in, in Iraq itself, 2 million. So this number of Christians was almost nothing to the rest of them, huge number. So we had put people also in unfinished building. Um, then uh, we kind of started thinking with rain coming with the winter, we had to think of something else. So the unfinished buildings, schools started, so people had to go out of schools. We started to think of how we can uh, help people. And we start with these, uh, what we call caravans. It's uh, prefabricated material homing. So uh, it's like uh, one room, seven foot. Um, some of them are connected to facilities, bathroom showers, some are not. And we start putting people in these places. Uh, we made villages of, this place, of uh, these containers. I got to live in them for over a year, one of them, because uh, the sisters were just like, you know, everyone else. We had to leave overnight. We had one convent in Ankawa, and we didn't have place to go. So we were at the seminary. We stayed at the Chaldean seminary for two months, about. And then we um, put these containers in the garden 
of the convent, and we lived in them. We still have some sisters living in them. So there were almost like three stages of people um, being sheltered. In the beginning, we had the churches and parks, then tents, then schools and unfinished buildings. Then we had the caravans, and the church also tried to rent some homes and place families in them. Um, with all this going on, um, was all the church responsibility to deal with. So it was the church to provide place, it was the church to provide food, it was the church to take people to the hospital if something happened. So all uh, priests and sisters were divided to these camps. Uh, this picture was taken um, in unfinished building. I worked in the unfinished building for a couple months before they were moved out. And it's not that the camera is not good. It was just so much dust in the building that you could not get a better picture. And um, it was like a mall and it was not finished. So if you see these plastic things, these are the dividers between like families. Then we had the caravans, uh, as you can see, very close to each other. And this is one of the villages we made for people to stay. So uh, the night of the 6th, uh, we had only, with all that mass, people are le were leaving. We only had one person lost his life, and it was bef because of a bullet fired in the air. Uh, there was uh, a girl taken from her mother a few weeks later when we left uh, Karakosh, my hometown, when we left. Not everyone left. There were people who decided to stay behind and decided to stay behind because they thought it was going to be only a couple of days and people come back. So uh, when they tried later to leave, uh, the ISIS did not let them. They let the elderly leave, but not the young. So there was this family. They, uh, they took her child from her. She couldn't do anything. There is no news about her, just gone. There was a couple. Uh, they were young also. They were not allowed to leave. And then there was a young woman who was taken also by ISIS. And we don't know anything about these people. People lost everything, uh, material goods, properties, everything. And that's the hard thing for Christians in Iraq because they have always been the most educated people in the country. They could really like support themselves. They never needed that much help from the government. So to lose everything overnight was very hard on them. Uh, the other problem we faced when we were displaced that we could not, people could not get any money back from the banks because the ISIS controlled Mosul and they controlled all the banking there. So people could not draw any money back. So everyone all of a sudden was poor and everyone had nothing. Uh, there were some families when we started um, giving people some food and some necessary things some families could not take them. They just was way too hard for them because they keep saying it was our responsibility to give to the church. We used to give the church and we just can't take from the church. But one thing that is, has been really um, very powerful in the country that Christians stayed with their faith. They kept their faith. Now, um, of course, new questions arise because of that, because um, Christians in Iraq, we never like, had to choose. You know, we all inherited our faith. We were Catholics because our fathers were Catholics. People are Muslims because our, their fathers are Muslims. So we never thought of like, changing our religion or doing any of that. But this situation, for all of us, maybe most, I don't know, but we start asking, what's Christian faith? What does it mean to be Christian? Why us? Why all this happened to us? Um, there was a lot of anger, of course. Um, anger sometimes at God, um, anger toward each other. There was a lot of anger and people had to deal with this. But at least um, they found some answers for their faith. So it's really never been the same way before this, this all happened to us as, I mean, in, uh, in terms of faith as it is now. So uh, the impact on 
the, uh, of the situation on the Christians of Iraq. The first huge impact was immigration. There are about 4,000 Iraq Christians in Jordan today, 2,000 and a half 50, uh, Iraqi Christians in Lebanon, and then there is a small number in Europe and US, and of course there is a number still in Turkey. Uh, they are all waiting, hoping that they will be placed uh, in another country, resettled in another country. Uh, many of these people have not been resettled, obviously. People are waiting still for something to come. Um, it's uh, getting, well, people are losing patience because they can't find jobs. Uh, Jordan already had received so many refugees from Syria. Lebanon, the same thing. So to receive more from Iraq has been really a lot. Education. The first year of uh, our displacement, we could not send uh, anyone to school because uh, they could not learn uh, Kurdish that fast. So there were only few schools that speak or use Arabic language in their schools. So we sent uh, some children, but not everyone. So it became church uh, responsibility of dealing with this. Health matters. Again, uh, not, if you don't speak the language, you are not treated. So that was a huge problem uh, with the Kurdistan government in terms of hospitals. And then religious activities. So the main, the main concern of the church was how to deal with this. And for the past two years, they have been dealing with this in different ways. So we started, our main goal was to give people um, food. You know, st you start with the needs, basic needs, <coughs> food. After finding tents or places for them to live, we gave them food. Um, mattresses. Remember, these people had nothing. They were, like, sleeping on the street. We start giving some, some um, clothes. Uh, organize people in groups to cook together. So in camp, there will be a group that would cook for the whole group. Uh, we had sisters working with them. So we start with mic, um, milk and diapers, giving um, for children, mattresses, air coolers, refrigerators, water coolers, towels, shampoo and soap, clothes, chairs. Then we decided that all this was good uh, to do it, but there has to be more to do for people. Because giving things is, is the easy part. Educating people is the hard part. So as a community, we were working in, in camps for about a year and a half, doing like work, uh, giving people milk or giving them food or doing all this. But then we realized uh, volunteers can do that. And instead of us doing this, we could give this to volunteers to do it, and then we'll focus on education. So that's what we did. When you say community, you mean the Dominican community? Dominican community. community. The Dominican community and the church community, uh, we were, the Dominicans were the ones who thought of the education, so we start education system. So we start with renting houses to turn them to kindergarten. Uh, when, even when, we, when the church tried to replace people in these houses, they put like two or three families in three bedroom house. So the children have nowhere to go, nowhere to play. And of course, uh, in such situation, tense situation, children usually are the victims. So we start with kindergartens. We open three kindergartens first year. And then, well, we thought we could do a school. So with the help of humanitarian organizations, many of them really, we were able to build prefabricated school, school from prefabricated material. And, um, Last year when they start, we start with 520 children, first grade through sixth grade. By the end of this year, they were 430. Uh, the number went down because most of uh, these children, they just uh, left the country with their families. But, so with these uh, children, we, of course, gave them everything, starting with the backpack. And we have five sisters working there. Um, all the children in the school are IDPs. And all the teachers are IDPs, because most of these uh, teachers left, they had no jobs. So they are teaching in the school. So 
uh, some kindergartens. It was interesting to see the children in the first weeks. Um, one of our sisters runs these kindergartens, and she would try to um, she would try always to make them laugh or dance, and they would just refuse to do this. So she had an hour every day, or every other day. She would turn the, just the, the radio or the music on and tell them to dance, but uh, they would not move. They got used to it uh, later. We start also working outside of Kurdistan. We focused uh, outside of Erbil. We focused in, to, uh, in Erbil in the beginning because most of the IDBs were in Erbil. But then we realized there are other people, other communities that also moved out of Erbil. So um, Akra, a suburb of Erbil, uh, Dehok. Um, so we start working in different places. With the health system, the church, uh, Syriac church, opened up small clinic and uh, of course uh, people were being treated there so to sum up all this we'll say uh, in the first weeks of displacement the main difficulty was providing food and water later this issue turned out to be the easiest part of course it's easy to give the true challenge was to deal with the people who were full of anger and frustration and who could blame them our main task was to observe people's anger, listening to them and being with them. So people always would ask us, are you also going to leave the country as everyone else? And our answer has been the same since the first day we were there. We are going to stay as long there are people here. And that's the plan. We'll stay as long our people are there. As a result, started some families uh, religious church activities in camps and tent churches. People wanted to do things that they used to do in, in town. And of course, we managed to do these villages of housing, but it was hard to do a church. So we start with a tent. So people were celebrating masses, uh, baptism, weddings. Believe it we, or not, we had some weddings in these tents also. So uh, we start with tents, but then we kind of uh, got permission to make also churches from these uh, prefab prefabricated um, material. So we had two of them, and we still use them. But we had sisters just go to these camps and pray with people wherever they are. Uh, there are some buildings, uh, apartments are filled also with people. Uh, they are pretty far from where we work, but we uh, use, uh, we at least we have two sisters that go there twice a week to help um, organizing the things and celebrating masses. So sometimes we still do mass outside because there's no place for people to go. And we have some places where we still have tents. Um, in despite everything that people were going through, they asked if we could do First Communion for their children. So. We had it uh, last year, we had 500 children receiving First Communion. Now these are seven, no, they are nine and 10 years old. This year we did it again. And also we had 500 children. So um, yeah, uh, some activities we just have to do it because they give hope for people that life is continuing, that things will get better. Uh, if it's education, if it's a First Communion, baptism, um, these are maybe little things for people who are outside of Iraq, but they mean a lot for people. When a family have their child coming back from kindergarten, had learned how to pray, that means a lot for the family. Or they had first, first grade, finished first grade or second grade. It's, it, it means a lot for the families because they can see that there is future for their families to stay in Iraq. You have others who, of course, see that there is no future, and they, uh, they leave. So this, is, uh, this was last Friday, First Communion. Uh, this year, because the number was huge, they divided them to um, three parts. So that was uh, the last, last week. So we keep uh, saying that, you know, uh, in Iraq, in Arabic, we have two words that we use, uh, amal and raja. In English, is the same, means hope. But uh, for us, uh, we feel like the amal thing is finished. Uh, amal is 
to hope for something that will happen soon, tomorrow or near future. But hope is for something that, uh, for maybe far future, something will happen in years, years. So uh, probably in Iraq, the situation is telling us very clearly that there is no aman. There is no changes that are going to happen tomorrow or in a month or two. But we keep hoping that one day, someday, uh, things will change. People will go home. Um, it, it is hard to, to deal with the idea. Uh, in the first, when we were displaced, people were like, we just want to go home. We just want to go home. That, we all said that. Uh, but now, after two years, we start questioning that. Um, do we want to go home? And if we go home, are we prepared to see what's happening there? Because um, when we left our hometowns, the town was all empty, open to whoever want to come and take whatever they want. So our, our neighbors in neighboring towns, they just went to our hometowns and went to our homes and got what they wanted or took what they wanted. And so the question is now with the trust. Uh, Karakosh uh, was the largest community, so we had a college, we had hospital, we had a clinic, we had schools. So people from these Muslim towns around us used to come to Karakosh for everything, for everything. So uh, the, the question will be if we go back, how can we trust our neighbors? or can we even trust our neighbors?